Miles Sewer, Miles, the um, uh, facilitator for CIO chat and that offers executive and level participants from around the world and um, also has a weekly column at CIO.com. So uh, Miles and Martin, please take it away. So, you know, one of the things I really liked that you talked about today, Martin, was this notion of the architect moving from back office to front office to actually product value props. When you've done your research um, with uh, MIT Scissor, you know, what have you seen the biggest differences between organizations that are becoming digital natives or are digital natives and those legacy businesses that are out there? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so if you really mean digital natives here, uh, we mostly study what we call big old companies, traditional companies. And um, we do look at uh, digital native born digital companies, uh, hoping to find that traditional companies can learn so much from them. But then we find out that isn't always the case. But from an architectural perspective, there are there are huge differences. Uh, so for example, if you're a born digital company, uh, especially if you're a, a small company, um, then you start with one digital offering. Uh, and then at some point you realize, oh my gosh, we have to re-architect the basis of that offering. And so you start building a digital platform. And they are not as worried about the operational backbone uh, that comes last for them typically. Big old companies though, have started with the operational backbone uh, for decades and are now starting to develop digital offerings in order to also become a digital company. I, I wouldn't call them digital native then. Um, and that's what makes digital transformation so, so new. Um, born digital companies though, of course, uh, at some time will get where the traditional companies are and create a mess in their processes and their, in their, their, their systems. Um, uh, so that will definitely happen. You know, Open Group has a lot of recommendations on open standards and things like that. Um, you know, there are, you know, one of the things you talked about was this notion of an external developer, um, you know, platform. I love the example in the book about DBS Bank, who I got to meet with a while back, and how somebody came up with a whole new application for an ATM system. So could you talk a little bit about how you don't have to develop it all your own? Yeah, sure. Um, I, of course, I have to say a caveat in the beginning here. In our survey uh, that we did, now it's almost two years old though, uh, things could have changed, but they always change slower than we think and hope. Only 13% of companies, that big old companies, traditional companies, had a mature external developer platform. Um, this is early days. If you look at the Gartner Magic Quadrant, from 2019 uh, of uh, multi-industry, uh, in, in industrial internet of things platforms, nobody was in the leadership quadrant. So this area is clearly up for grabs, uh, I have to say. Um, and it, it, it's going to be challenging for individual within an industry type companies like Philips, right, being in, in healthcare, to establish themselves as the standard, simply because they're one of the competitors within healthcare in this case, and, and customers typically want an aggregator. Like we don't want a platform that only provides us songs from Universal Music. We want um, a platform that provides songs by Universal, Sony, Warner, and all the indies. And, and that's why we have these aggregators like Spotify, right? And so that's the same with external developer platforms. If you're not a tech company, you will have to form a consortium, I guess, uh, doing this on your own is going to be pretty difficult. Yeah, it's tough for companies to rethink the model and say, you know, Stephanie Best has written about this as well, about how, you know, you can, you can, you don't have to have everything. In fact, maybe you have your competitors' offerings alongside your offerings, so you provide a complete offering to the marketplace. Yeah, it's it's unavoidable unless you think that you can provide all offerings and all solutions to all your customers' problems all by yourself, and you have the smartest people, uh, and you can do the best. And that is that saying that out loud sounds ridiculous. So yeah, there is no way to avoid that. It's just really early days, and you need the other building blocks. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you talked a little bit about, you know, a new role for the enterprise architect. I mean, a lot of enterprise architects have been focused in the past on just getting an operational backbone going. 
you know, so you can standardize processes, so you can standardize how they all connect together. Um, what's the enterprise architect's role as you build for a digital platform? Yeah, so just to say a few words about the operational backbone there, I think that is the reality for many large companies that kind of enterprise architects have focused on the operational backbone. The aspiration, and for some absolutely the reality, don't get me wrong, has always been much broader, namely to architect the enterprise. That is the idea of enterprise architecture. And we will continue, by the way, to require brilliant architects in the area of the operational backbone and of processes. Uh, but I think there's a chance uh, right now, indeed, um, to broaden that reality towards the aspiration, right? simply because of the need to redesign and to think holistically across silos if you're going into digital offerings. And, and that's clearly a strength of architects. And um, yeah, I'm making it pretty, pretty black and white here, but building a digital platform is much less top down um, compared to introducing what you just said, introducing global standards, for example, because you don't know which functionality is shared. It's more like uh, tending to a coral reef that is evolving rather than building a formal garden and laying out, this is how this is going to work. And so that's a pretty different role uh, that you have. And it's, uh, it can be um, pretty terrifying <laughs> to deal with that. <laughs> you know, uh, as you look at it, Open Group's been think, doing a lot of thinking historically in their IT for IT group on um, value stream thinking. Um, they've been starting to work on notions of digital products and things like that. Um, standards now. Um, so, you know, how, how does what you've been talking about kind of fit with that? And can we get a couple of your PhD students to work on some of these standards with us? Absolutely. <laughs> I just have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, so I, I love the underlying idea. I, I didn't hear everything you said, but I, I heard a few bits and pieces there. I, I love the underlying idea of, of having IT and business merge, right? And that, by the way, the fact that we keep saying business and IT shows, we aren't quite there yet. Um, some leaders actually that we talk to uh, talk about biz DevOps. Um, uh, and, and yeah, um, so I, I think that's a great idea to merge them. Um, you have to be careful about what you're merging there, uh, though, and what it supports. Um, on the one end, if it's, it's typically in most companies, you have these two parts of technology, one at least. One is the classic IT, and the other one is the new digital. They might be reporting to the same person, but they are very, very different. And so the question is, are you merging uh, kind of the classic IT uh, with the business part, or are you merging um, the, the digital part with digital offer that supports digital offerings? Are you merging that uh, with the business? Um, hopefully, we'll be able to do both, uh, but I don't see that happening a lot, I have to say. Um, and, and at least not in big mothership companies. I do see that in smaller businesses, for example, at Audi, at Audi Business Innovation, there it's difficult to tell uh, kind of business and IT apart. Great, these were fantastic questions and I know that our audience has a bunch of questions that they would like to ask. So I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Dave and I believe Dave is gonna um, deal with some of the questions from the audience. Is that correct, everyone? Yep, that is that is correct. Uh, thank you and Martin, I'm very conscious of your time. We'll try to keep this quick. Uh, First one I'll ask here is uh, one of interest to many of the architects in the audience. Of course, you know TOGAF has uh, what we sometimes refer to as the crop circle, the phases that you go through. Um, how do you see those correlating with you know, both the building blocks that you identify in the design for digital or the processes that, that companies go through yeah. in order to move to digital? Yeah, so of course, um, Jeannie, Cynthia, and I were thinking about uh, how, do we, how do we relate this to existing um, frameworks and standards uh, like TOGAF. And um, well, one of the things we do realize um, is that the moment business executives um, hear the term architecture, uh, they start rolling their eyes many times. And so this is why we didn't connect it explicitly, actually, to any of the standards. Um, they are great, don't get me wrong, right? They help a lot. It is just that our 
mission here was I th that we saw well, I, the time is is ripe. It's the point in time where we need to get business executives um, engaged in redesigning their businesses. And so uh, what we designed there is a much higher level, so to say, if you want, kind of like this is the, the kind of things that you need to think about if you want to achieve this year. And I, I think this links pretty well, though, um, if you want to operationalize this to, uh, to other standards like Togaf. Mm -hmm. Great. Um one of the things we've seen is, uh, and uh, this is very clear in the CISR case studies, is how financial services is um, is really buying into this uh, digitization and digital digitization and digital transformation. Yeah. Um, do you? What do you think are some good? Uh, the question was, which bank is, uh, in your knowledge, is the most advanced in digital transformation? But maybe we can also ask, you know, what are the practices you see in banks that that are helping them do digital transformation? Uh, great question. Whoever asked that question. Um, I'm in love, I shouldn't say that as a researcher, but I kind of, oh, we, we looked at what um, with two banks, and they themselves don't view themselves that way. <laughs> so if anyone is in the audience from those companies, it's one is USAA, um, and the other one is DBS. Miles already mentioned uh, DBS. Um, what, I, what I really like about USAA uh, is that they, are thinking customer first and uh, they don't do a digital transformation just to become digital but for example their uh, move into um, um, into live events kind of hey let's let's not think how we organize how we are organized but let's think in terms of problems of customers this is kind of the definition of a digital offering how can we solve a customer's problem uh, I'm buying a house right now and man I would love to have USA live events that help me with buying a house. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can I can say that um, they're doing pretty well. Uh, from my perspective, if you ask people at USAA, they have always stuff to complain about. But that's also part of the most successful companies. They're never happy with what they're doing. And so while we're on the the subject of of banks uh, and best practices, um, you know, one of the things that stood out to me in the CISR case studies, um, and notably DBS with their Digify Bill, which I'll always remember. Uh, and we heard yesterday from Fidelity that they are dedicating 20%, they call it 20% Tuesday, uh, to uh, on staff training. So what what's your view on, you know, looking beyond the architects um, and the product managers here, how do you see uh, digital awareness and, and, and digital skills for the workforce as a whole being important in digital transformation? Oh, my gosh, yeah, really important. Um, so it, it's not enough to have the executive committee or the architects uh, who violently agree on what needs to be done, uh, kind of in a digital mindset indeed. Um, so this is about getting 20,000 people or more, uh, or much more, uh, to think and work in a different way. The way, uh, what we do see though, is that, that a number of companies, and Unicre is one of them, uh, they say we are not going to do this uh, with a broad uh, change um, a management effort, um, but we are going to do this initiative by initiative. We're trying to involve as many people as possible in kind of what it means to actually develop a digital offering and the way this works, because the moment people go through a very different way of working, a testing and learning, working together with your customer, um, uh, an agile way, for example, a design thinking workshop, they become uh, multipliers to this and tell other people about how um, effective this actually is and that truly helps. So I heard earlier in, in your talk, start small. And I guess that is indeed, you can't, you can't transform a company of 120,000 people um, top down that this just won't work. Yeah. All right. So we'll do one more question. I don't think we're going to get to all the questions. So if, if um, there's any Thank opportunity. <laughs> Get them absolutely, absolutely. Um, so in order to lead a digital transformation of a company, which which role should the leader role be? Is it the EA? Is it uh, marketing? Is it the IT guy, the CIO? Is it the business lead? Um, any any common patterns there? What And what which one is the one that works best to become a digital company? Well, uh, I have to say, if the business leadership takes on that role, then everything else becomes so much easier. Mm -hmm. If it's IT, if it's the enterprise architects, who get this anyway, 
um, you are fighting an uphill battle. You have to convince people of a sense of urgency that you actually have to do this. And so if the business realizes that this is actually not about technology, but that this is about business strategy and about realizing their mission actually with the use of digital technologies, you are already, well, I'm going to just say halfway there. I'm not here, you're probably not halfway there, uh, but that is the best start. So if it's a business leader who's actually picking this up, oh my gosh, then uh, you're in a great position. Yeah, there was a great quote from one of the CISR case studies that, you know, once you once you start talking about the business, you've already gone off the track. Yeah. So if they're separate, you're you're done. Yeah. Great stuff. Anyway, I, I think I know we've run quite a bit over here, so I think I'll hand it back to Steve Nunn. And uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, great inspirational stuff as always, and hope to see you again soon at the Open Group. Thank you, everyone.